Let's go back in time to 1932 as Converse brings you historic footage of the legendary original Celtics with whom all great professional teams are compared. We have now taken over your radio. Richie Guerin is about to show you the most important step in getting past a man. It's the first one. An Oscar will inbound it. The men in green, the Milwaukee Bucks, that's Al Cinder against Bellamy. Person has Jordan. Allen shakes Gray gets two! Gilmore to go in the first quarter for the Cow Palace. Here's Barry. Jordan. Open. Chicago with the lead. Hello and welcome back to the Over and Back NBA podcast on the podiumgame.com. We're a member of the HP Basketball Network. I'm Jason Mann, and with me, as always, is Rich Krejci. Rich, great, great to be back with you. Yeah, it's been a, it's been it's been too long, too damn long since we've done it this. Ha- so I'm, I'm excited, your, especially this subject. I'm I'm very pumped about this particular you're, subject. You're cursing, so. so I know you're excited. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Are we explicit? I don't know if we, uh, if we have the explicit rating on iTunes. It'll be okay. But... I think you know. I think maybe a few dams here are not going to uh, yeah, right, you know yeah. throw the, the whole game off. But not throwing any f bombs out. No, here. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. You know. Um. So <laughs> so what are we gonna talk about today? Oh, we're talking Detlef Schrem. Oh yeah. One of my favorite NBA Jam players. Woo, woo. <laughs> Which we will talk about a little bit later. Yeah, this is one that I, I don't even know how we came about it, but Detlef Schramm. Yeah, likes. you know, I mean, why not? There doesn't really need to be an excuse for Detlef Schramm. I right. mean, um, yeah, I mean, he's obviously just a huge groundbreaker. One of the real, you know, one of the first European players um, to have any type of success in the NBA, probably after Sven Nader. Uh, and and kind of, you know, I, I think started that wave or was kind of part of the start of that wave that brought a lot of European players into the game in the 90s and 2000s. Of course, Tony Kukoc being another key one. Uh, Dirk Davitsky, of course, you know, being being the, the greatest uh, European player, I think it's fair to say, in uh, NBA history. Um, Yeah, that's pretty... Yeah, I'm trying to think if there would be any... Who, who would be the next best contender if you were... Um, that, that is an excellent question that I had not prepared. Yeah, I wonder. Um, cause yeah, I think it would be Dirk. Yeah. Just, just about it off the top of my head. Maybe we have to do a, a separate show on that, but sure. uh, yeah, who? <sighs> well, we'll come back to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. I'm racking my brain now and it's <laughs> completely unrelated to what we're. So he was a three-time all-star in six, 16 season. Um, played very effectively into his late 30s. He was a member of one um, all-NBA team, the third team in 95 season. Um, two-time sixth man of the year. Uh, he grew from a role player in Dallas and some interesting late 80s Dallas Mavericks team. Became a super sixth man in Indiana on some of the early Reggie um, Miller teams before they kind of really you know, had their success. Um, and then uh, most famously became, you know, regular all-star level player in Seattle, you know, uh, part of a, a, you know, strong group with Sean Kemp and Gary Payton and Hersey Hawkins and, and other guys, you know, he, but he was definitely, you know, a, a key cog there for some, you know, very strong teams, including one that made the finals. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's the way we sort of broke this down, too. I think it's perfect, too, because it's sort of the way I think of, of his career as well is, is we broke it down. We're going to talk, you know, Dallas and then Indiana and then Seattle and and Portland is those sort of, you know, four teams. But I feel like two separate eras of, of that left shrimp as well. Do you, you agree? Oh, yeah, I, that, definitely. I mean, the, the first half of his career, um, you know, he was very good, but I don't know how important he was. And then later in, you know, in the second half of his career, he also became a very, you know, a, a really key player for some really mm-hmm. good teams. So, um uh, so we're going to, yeah, I mean, we've, we got a lot to talk about, so we'll um, hit back to it. We want to l- first uh, talk a little bit about uh, just kind of give some props to some people who have been uh, doing cool stuff, uh, you know, either – for us or sharing stuff or, or, or what have you. So I want to, uh, we've had some, apparently people listen to this. I was, I'm shocked. Well, <laughs> yeah. actually like... well, you know, we, we, we like people listen to it. I mean, you know, we're, we're not quite that shocked, but at least I'm not, you know, so I, <laughs> I have confidence in us. I don't want to get, copied. well, no, I'm, I'm more shocked that people are like, 
that they listen to us, not not just tolerate us and like be like, oh, I'll just listen to this crap or whatever. That they're actually going to interact with yeah. it and and say, hey, I listened to this episode and here is a fun note about this. You know, like they don't listen to the first three minutes of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're like, hey, you mentioned this in like the ninety minute of this show or whatever. It's cool. It's it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's no secret that we can run long, so I can understand people <laughs> need you know, to, to you know either take an intermission in between or you know, maybe not always listen to the whole thing. I get it, but. Um, anyway, um, I want to thank uh, Mark Roberts, who uh, gave us some really cool links to some uh, uniform research on, you know, we talked about uh, NBA jerseys of 1999 in our last show. Also passed along a few uh, articles related to that left that helped us in our research. Um, also wanted to give prep, props to um, Raphael Canton, who runs the NBA Trades Tumblr, which is definitely, he's, he's so good. Yeah, it's a great site. It really, really breaks down some, you know, the trades talking about, you know, the before and after and, you know, really getting into some really great research. So um, he's awesome. More people should follow him and, and be linking to his work because it, it's really good. So um, NBA trades.tumblr.com, I believe, is the uh, site. You can follow him on Twitter as well. Um, we'll. We'll have links to it at the uh, bottom of the show notes. And then also uh, just a guy who's um, uh, Matthew Kovac, who's been sharing some cool photos, not just with us, but with, uh, you know, Curtis Harris and you know different people who are you know, really interested in NBA history, kind of related to some of the subjects in our yeah. show or or subjects we've mentioned on Twitter. So that's really neat to just see. I'm just I'm just honored to be a part of that mention group. He's like, hey, I'm sending this to Probe's history and over and back. It's like, ooh, okay, absolutely. <laughs> like that's so yeah, that's that means a lot. So, so that, that really we're is. we're into that. And <laughs> Curtis, of course, who's been on our show a couple times, has also just uh, said nice things about us on the internet, which has uh, helped I think helped us grow our audience a little bit and uh, made people you know. Know, um, mistakenly respect us so i uh <laughs> i very much we appreciate that uh so props to these people so uh yeah we're gonna take a little break and then we are going to uh, chat about the beginning of uh detlef shrimp's time in in the united states the dallas mavericks select detlef shrimp on the university of washington detlef shrimp has come to the dance Ready to party. <laughs> but, uh, he definitely wins best dressed award thus far. Although Patrick Ewing was looking pretty spiffy when he was selected first. Dudley Shrimp, the University of Washington, 6'9, 220 pounds. Played his club basketball in Germany. Played at Centralia Washington High School a little bit, but he is a West German youngster. That's where he was born. How good is he as an open floor player? So I think he's a great player. Uh, the, the person who he reminds me of is right here with us today, Rick Barrett. I, I saw him play. We played in Western Region, and I had an opportunity to see him play, and I definitely thought that he reminded me an awful lot of Rick. Rick he can score outside, he can score inside, he runs the floor well, and he defends reasonably well. So I, I definitely liken him to Rick Barrett. The town is gonna talk. All right, and we're back here on the Over and Back podcast talking Detlef Shrimp. And now let's begin with his his early life, um, even before the NBA career, uh, his growing up in West Germany. We talked about at the top of the show of him being a European player. Uh, I did a little bit of quick research. I, the second one is really tough. I don't that that's gonna that might have to be a listener uh, comment on that of like cause there's obviously a dirt guy, and then there's so many other guys I saw in the second. There's like a Vladi and you know Pejas and 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 you know Detlef as well. I think you can maybe even make a case for him as well. So there, there's a lot of really interesting ones. But no, obviously born in West Germany. Um, he played soccer until he was 13. Uh, he got an argument with a junior national coach and then quit the team. Do we know what started this argument? I, I don't. Th- I don't know the specifics of it. I just did that. It was basically just kind of the background. It's like, oh, he quit the team. I know basketball was kind of rising in West Germany during that time. Yeah. Um, he met former UCLA center John Ecker, who was coaching a basketball team there, and uh, sparked his interest. Uh, I, I guess you know he quickly became uh, good enough that. Um, you know, he's like, well, if I'm really going to make it, I need to go to the United States. So he ended up as a uh, high school senior in, enrolling in Centralia High School in Washington uh, and then won a basketball title there, then was recruited by Washington won uh, Pac-10 titles in 84 and 85. He played guard, forward, and center, so he's a very versatile player, um, and, you know, and demonstrated, you know, so many skills that he had. I mean, just the, the great passing for his size, uh, be, you know, um, 
I'm not sure if this is so much in college, but later on, you know, just became very effective from the uh, three point line. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Was it a three point line? And when he was in, that, I feel like that 87 sounds in right to college. me. In college. It, let me. Like yeah. When later. was the. Yeah, when was the college three-point line? Let, let me let me find out for sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, he we... he had the skill, you know, just to attack off the dribble, posting up versus small forwards. I mean, he just he he you know displayed that multi versatile. You know, starting in college, but obviously um, going on later. He also played with a fellow West German, uh, who Christian Velp. Um, who it's spelled Welp, which um, is one of my favorite uh, NBA <laughs> names. Uh, he didn't last long in the uh, in the NBA, but uh, he was a Pac-10 Freshman of the Year um, when Detlef was on the team. Another guy who was kind of an important, you know, West German import. Sorry, not to interrupt. Eighty-six, uh, eighty-seven was the official introdu- uh, introduction for all college okay. basketball. There were some conferences that did it before, but that 80, 86, 87 was everybody's got it. Okay, now, so. well, we don't we don't know for sure if he was a great three point shooter in college, but he became one fairly quickly. So, um. Uh, the other key kind of West German player during that time was uh, from Indiana, Juve Blob, um, another great name who uh, – and then would later be his teammate on Dallas, although he did, did not last long in the uh, NBA as well. Uh, so uh, another thing worth noting is that um, – well, he played for uh, West Germany in the 84 Olympics and also the uh, 83 and 85 Eurobasket in which uh, in 85 West Germany actually won the Eurobasket there. So yep. and uh, his wife, Mary, was a former um, hurdler on the uh, West German uh, Olympic team. Uh, and there was kind of a good SI article sort of on the the rides of the West Germans and Detlef himself, you know, with, with kind of some interesting uh, tidbits in it. Uh, he was called the white magic for his ball handling. Um, he said that he uh, loved magic and Dr. J, thinks he can play guard and loves to pass, maybe even a little bit too much. And then the other kind of interesting note about it is that talking about the crowds that sort of chant Nazi at him. And uh, they, he said they seem a little childish, but they don't bother me. So. <laughs> I guess he had a decent attitude uh, about, uh, you know, uh, about dealing with that. And then um, w- one thing before sure. before we move on, um, I want to talk. It was kind of interesting as well. Um, and, and we'll see this a little bit more. I thought that SI article that you're talking about where he says that he, he thought he could play guard and he loves to pass and that sort of stuff. And we saw that in his career. And that's that's something that if you watch that left shrimp, you know, videos or you're familiar, you know, familiar with him, you know, that that's a guy who, and, and you hear it on the commentary anytime you're watching these videos that he's six ten and passes like a guard. He kind of moves like a guard. He, he doesn't, I mean, he backs down like a forward, but pretty much every part, every other part of his game, it seems to be sort of guard play. He, he was, he, and, and, and that's been a kind of a theme with a lot of the Europeans that come in that they sort of have this ability to be tall, but also, you know, where America was developing a lot of the big men in a way where they would just back down. They were big behemoths and that sort of stuff. Whereas Europe, you got a lot of these guys. And he was one of the first who came in and was multi, I mean, multi-talented. He could do a bunch of different stuff. We saw it later with Sabonis. And, and we always heard that with Sabonis as well, that if he came, you know, 10 years earlier, he would have blown the doors off the NBA. But obviously we got the not so good Sabonis. But no, I thought Delif was, was was particularly interesting. Yeah. And I thought that quote exa- was exactly, you know, what we saw later in his life when he, you know, would love to play guard, love to pass, you know, good shooter, that sort of stuff. So very interesting. Yeah. He uh, ended up being picked uh, eighth in the 85 NBA draft, which was the the infamous or famous uh, Patrick Ewing draft, uh, the uh, the first lottery uh, draft. Um, and he, he definitely um, rates highly among the players who are there. Um, he's uh, third in win shares per 48 to Carl uh, Malone and Sabonis. Uh, and then fourth in total win shares to Malone, uh, Patrick Ewing, and Terry Porter. So yeah, so nice company. Yeah, Terry Porter is kind of a surprise to be that high on there. I mean, I thought yeah, he was a good Porter, player, but yeah, that could be. I wonder. Um, I wonder about his raw numbers because Porter played a lot of years, didn't he? Yeah, well, I mean, it, I, I guess mean, that, that left it too, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah, no. To be fair, I mean, yeah, his win share twenty two to thirty eight. Yeah, no, I mean, hey, you got to be good to get, yeah. <laughs> get that many as and well. His, but yeah, Porter was surprising. His win shares forty eight were right. You know, they were not. They yeah. were just a little bit lower than that left. So um, sure. So he wasn't just just accumulating. You know, win shares over a course of a year. He had a, yeah. I mean, he had a few years. I'm looking here uh, just really quick. Yeah, early nineties uh, with Portland, obviously. You know, over ten win shares in in you know three consecutive years and then nine and another. So oh, and nine and another. Oh crap. So he had five years of of above nine win shares. Yeah. So yeah, okay. Have had a Terry Porter. <laughs> it's absolutely, absolutely. So, um, and you know, uh, the Mavericks are sort of a definitely a team on the rise. Um, you know, they have they've got Mark Aguirre, who's um, uh, you know, kind of their star. Well, I guess next to Rolando Blackman. 
uh, James Donaldson, who's a pretty strong center. They have a young Derek Harper, a young Sam, a very, just very young. Very young yeah, Sam Perkins. Um, Sam Perkins. Uh, they actually, Bill Wennington is a rookie. He's not really an important player for them, but he, oh, you stop. he's there. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they really. It's three, it's three games started. Where is, well, I have 56 games. Yeah, you know. Yeah, there you go. So, um, it's hard to imagine Bill Wennington as a young player. You know what I mean? Right. He just seems like, cause when he was on the bulls, he just, even if he was like 30, he just seemed like he was like, <laughs> like 38, like no matter what, like yeah. that's a guy who's just perpetually been like, I, I just can't imagine seeing a 22 year old Bill Wennington, but yeah. so they, in the 86 season were 44 and 38. They were second in league in offense, 21st in defense. Um, they made their third straight playoff appearance, their third season with a mid forties win total. And they fell in the second round of the Lakers four games to two. So, you know, have to feel decent about that result. Um, he was ninth on the team in minutes in, uh, 1969 or excuse me, nine, 969, <laughs> um, not in the year 1969. And, um, uh, also, Dick Mata was the uh, Dallas Mavericks coach, uh, good old crusty uh, Dick Mata. Um, and uh, he also sported, well, I guess, what you might call an interesting mustache uh, during that time. I, I, I don't, <laughs> we did have some mustache-related uh, tweets um, going on. I, I mean, asking us to delve deeply, of course, into the um, into the great mustache. Um, so I don't. It's it's a superior mustache. Let's let's. Yeah, it's a little. I don't know if it's quite as good as the Larry Bird stash, but it's 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 heavy. It's it's, it's, it's a very it's heavy thicker. mustache for me. It, it is coming a little bit perilously close to a Chaplin mustache, um, <laughs> which is obviously a little bit of it can be a problem if you're German. But um, but you know, uh, I I think he looks better without the mustache. But it's a respectable effort. I'm you know I'm willing to give it some points. Yeah, it's not bad. It uh, it curves a little early, which is kind of odd. It's it's a very yeah. It's uh it it he he definitely upgraded by getting rid of it. I, I agree. I'm not sure exactly when he busted out the flat top. That's what I was trying. I'm trying to look through pictures here to kind of see here. I mean, I, I there, obviously it was early Pacers, but I, I I can't find a picture of him in a Pacers uniform without the flat top. But I yeah, was he flat top with the Mavs at any point? Um, did he have a fl- I. I don't think he did with the Mavs, but I know he did with the uh, – or I haven't seen pictures of it with the Mavs, but I know he did with the uh, Pacers. So Yeah, that's that's all I, all I found is every Pacers picture I see, he has the flat top. So it must have been in between that year. Maybe that was a uh, – we'll talk about it a little bit. The repress – he was he was depressed about <laughs> – or no, not, not depressed, rather, encouraged by the move. So he decided to go to uh, the ridiculous flat top. And, and there's those early Pacers years, it's like a flat top, but it's also really long in the back. Yeah, so it's kind of like a flat top mullet because. <laughs> well, you know, there's a there's a you know business up front party in the back. Yeah. absolutely. You know, that's that's essential. Um, so I can still confirm. Yeah, no, uh, no Mavericks pictures with the flat top, and no Pacers pictures without it. All right. So. Well, if anyone can actually track down the mullet, <laughs> Pinpoint, I want the day. Yeah, <laughs> if possible, the day that he went yeah. to the flat top, we would greatly appreciate it. So, thank you. Yes. Um. So next is eighty six, eighty seven. Um. The Mavs improved to fifty five and twenty seven. Uh, much, uh, you know, they're in the middle of the league as far as defense goes. Uh, second seed, it's looking good for them, but then they are upset by the uh, 39 win Sonics, who were um, led by Dale Ellis, who had been traded from the um, from the Mavericks to the Sonics. I think partly to make room for um, Detlef, you know. Yeah. So, um, and and Ellis just kind of went. Um, crazy in that I mean he had uh hit 29.5 points you know uh eight rebounds uh shooting uh 56 percent from the floor you know 50 percent from three-point range so that's a pretty good series yeah but getting his minutes almost doubled as you mentioned Detlef rather uh, getting his minutes doubled is sort of leads to the as you said yeah Dale L's you know removed to give a little bit more room for Detlef sure. it, it, it certainly seems that way without knowing you know the exact background I, but, yeah, I, no, I believe I during the reading that that was mentioned specifically like you know that um he was traded for that reason so mm-hmm. um and um and then there's a sort of another feature. This is before that playoff series, but during like December of 86. So early in that season talking about how, you know, the, the, the Mavs are rising and there was kind of some interesting thoughts at the time, like kind of, kind of just the difference between white and black players. Like it was weird. It was considered weird by the writer, I guess that um, 
Shrimp kind of played like a stere- stereotypically like a like a they say an inner city player. I guess it's a quote. But, <laughs> is there a way yeah, around of well, saying black? Being, yeah. well, this is I guess this is from a quote. So uh, being from Germany, he never heard how white guys were so supposed to play. So he emulated the players he liked. Doctor J and Magic is also talk about how um, he. Um, it, that um that he listened to to rap music at the time like that that was also sort of like thought of as like a novelty like he listened to you know quote like black music which is just you know funny today because of course you know um hip-hop and r&b are the most popular music genres and that right. pretty much everyone listens to but at the time it was i guess considered more of a novelty so i just that thought that was just sort of an interesting crazy white guy like, I, like, it, I like that he, he didn't play how white people were supposed to play right exactly <laughs> you know well like, I, I mean i think that may have been that quote may have been a little bit of t- tongue-in-cheek but but still yeah, yeah but it, yeah, it is it's it, it's just something obviously that no one would say today, you know. So um so you wanna talk a little bit about the next season? Yeah, absolutely. So uh eighty seven eighty eight. Uh again, this is another really successful year here, uh fifty three and twenty nine, and this is the first year uh with Suns coach. Uh John, is it McLean? McLeod? I, I can never I think it's pronounce. McLeod. That's uh, yeah, I hate those ones that are why <laughs> You know what I mean? Do you hate because there's Jay, there's um what's his uh, the, the, the Cubs general manager is Jason McLeod or whatever and it's spelled the same way. Why is that McLeod? Yeah, I, I don't M A C capital L E O D McLeod. I don't I don't on. know. Maybe the guy with the last name of Krejci isn't the one who uh, <laughs> to throw around. Yes, but... <laughs> get your last name figured out, guys. All right, but no, obviously this is the um. They were third seed this year, so they fell a seed, but we're still, you know, super successful with uh, 53 wins. Uh, they beat the sixth seeded Rockets, and then the second seeded Nuggets, uh, and then again, unfortunately, fell in seven games to the Lakers. Uh, Detlef, surprisingly, though, did not play in Game Seven. Yeah, I think you know he would. They like tighten the rotation in that game. I think there were like mm-hmm. like seven players for Dallas played uh, in that game, and he was the that was like an all hands on deck. We're just guy, like right, yeah, yeah. You guys are just gonna die. And, and, and they were, <laughs> we need to win I mean, this, they yeah. were a deep team. By then, they had Tarpley, who was awesome until drugs got him. You know, um, you know, the rest of the guys were all kind of between. 26 and 28 you know the 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 top players so they were just you know all these guys who were right at the right age and you know were were really great so i I can understand you know maybe i can understand the decision you know without like looking at the game film and going back into every single detail but i i I can see kind of where you know he's just on such a deep team and he's still fairly young and you know maybe is a guy where it's hard for the thinking of the time for him to quite like fit into the team. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe in that kind of situation, but um, and, that, and that game seven, I'm looking at the box score right now. It, it was, a, as we said, it was like an all hands on deck sort of deal. I mean, Brad Davis is the only guy who um, played less than 30 minutes and he played seven and he shot one time. Right. So, exactly, yeah. and he's even a really good player on that team as well. He's still an important player on that team, but yeah, it was basically Derek Harper, uh, Blackman, uh, Aguirre, Donaldson, Perkins, and Tarpley were the only ones that played and they played over 30 minutes and, and Harper played 46. So yeah. And that was the, yeah, that was a, <laughs> let's, let's no, we're not trusting anybody else besides the guys we know for sure. Cause this is a, you know, we, a must win for the, yeah, the, the, there was a, uh, a second, uh, that was, was this the uh, the second of the back-to-back laker title years and they went through they had to beat every single opponent in seven games to uh to to win that mm-hmm. um what well, to win that title uh i'm trying to remember if they beat the pistons in seven too they, they had to go through all the early rounds effort. yeah i think they did they had to go to the pistons in seven as well so so that's certainly a uh <laughs> nice. you know um a, a tough road for them but they were able to um Make it through. Uh, Donaldson and Kareem had some had some great battles in the inside. I mean, there's a LA Times article kind of talks about the series a little bit, and then in Game Seven, Magic demanded to defend Tarpley to keep him off the boards, which is just interesting. I mean, just shows like what a tremendous player Magic was that he would yeah. <laughs> do that. I'm going to be the guy to stop him from rebounding yeah, Kareem. Right. Know? Well, <laughs> because Tarpley had 20 you know, multiple games with 20 right, rebounds yeah. in that series. So, um, and then Detlift is sixth on the team again in minutes this year. Um, and 18.3 minutes a game uh, per game in the playoffs. So, um, and, and we talked about this Mavericks team a little bit, I think, in our, our, our Jersey podcast. But they're a very interesting team that I don't know if enough people kind of look at or give credit to. Because as you mentioned, there's a few, you know, we talked about a few series here. And in this one in particular, I mean, they're one game away 
you know, being to an NBA Finals, and we just sort of think of them as an afterthought in the 80s. Like, I really don't know if enough people, especially because a lot of people in my generation, we grew up and they were just a laughing stock, you know, in the early 90s, and it looked like this team had never been good, but they had been a really good, them, them and the Bucks are some of the two more interesting teams of the 80s for me, just teams that never quite got there and really just kind of get lost in history in a lot of ways. Yeah, and they, they collapsed very quickly, which I think is part mm-hmm. of, I mean, but, you know, if they had won Game 7 and made it to the finals even if they had lost in the finals they'd be thought yeah it doesn't matter they would be yeah. thought of completely differently you know <laughs> sure, any exactly, team that right. makes the finals automatically has that cachet even if they're not a particularly good team you know you you just you made the finals so you know you're now the winner is obviously remember more than the loser but you know but you're still you know you have that finals run it's, that yeah it's more of an accomplishment it, it, in a lot of ways where where uh, you know people always say you know you need those titles or whatever but getting a guy to you know you, people always mention that too well he got them to the finals or whatever you know like an Allen Iverson is him not really yeah it would have been great if he won it but I think people give him enough credit just for getting there in, in a lot of ways and and I think th- th- these teams in general the Bucks and the Mavericks especially the Mavericks would have been thought of a lot different just just getting there even if they got pummeled and even if they lost in four games that would have been fine but they would have been a really interesting matchup with the Pistons that year too I, I'd be very very I wish I could had a time machine to go back and see that but absolutely um and um you know the the next year that you know kind of all just falls apart for the mavericks um there's a great post um from the nba trades tumblr blog that i mentioned um where um you know basically they got off to a pretty strong start at 17 and 9 then they lost seven in a row to start off 89 um they uh james donaldson who was their starting center had been hurt tarpley was dealing with some drug issues and then big one is that uh mark aguire was just hated by everybody on the team and there's an si article that details that in um detail because uh detlef was traded february 21st 89 and then aguire was traded like right or you know almost exactly the uh same time um for adrian danley which is you know kind of a famous it's a famous trade because of the perception that isaiah forced stanley out and got in and got his buddy aguire in and of course afterward the pistons did win their two titles after failing the year before so um you know the perception of that deal is is interesting but um uh, Detlef was traded for uh, uh, was a trade along with a second round pick, which ended up being Antonio Davis for uh, for Herb Williams, who was a kind of an aging center um, who had a pretty long, you know, decent career. Yeah, and um, so then he was shifted to the uh, Pacers, and the Pacers were an even bigger mess than the uh, Mavericks that year. They had. Um, <laughs> they started off with Jack Ramsey, who was 0-7, uh, then had Mel Daniels, who was 0-2, George Irvine, who was 6-14, and and finally Dick Versace, who does better at 22 and 31. And Jeez. once they um, – has that ever? I mean, I, I I don't know if anybody knows or if you know offhand. Anybody seen that had four coaches in one year? Uh, I, I there's three. I get the like the interim coach deal. I I see three a lot, but four. <laughs> like yeah, I. That that is, I, I feel like I've seen it maybe in one of those jazz teams of the uh, late seventies, but uh, you know I'd, I'd have to. And ABA is no ABA teams do not count. Right, by the way. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am not counting Probably ABA 14 teams. That's coaches. where their checks bounced, and the coach was like, "Uh, no, yeah. like I enjoy being paid." No, so, NBA. I don't want ABA. Yeah. No, NBA. The, the, so find the that, Pacers but. were eleven and forty when. Um, when Detlef joined, but then actually ended up being 17 and uh, 14, uh, was given a bigger role. His minutes jumped from 22.8 to 31.4. And basically at this point kind of had evolved from a slightly above average to very good player. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He, uh, he, he definitely embraced it. You can tell that, you know, going from a, a winner to a loser or, or sort of a winner, I guess. I mean, I, I, he could probably see the, the writing on the wall with that team, but to go into that and being going to a team that, you know, as you mentioned, 11 and 40 and under a lot of turmoil though, but he's still, you can tell from just looking at the numbers, the box scores, the game scores, there's one, he, he embraced that. He knew he was getting a bigger role and really made the most of it because we're going to find out, you know, the next year, just, just how good he, he was able to be, you know, when given the time. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, uh, the 90 Pacers are, um, uh, the next season, he's fourth on the team in minutes. They also have Reggie Miller, who's leading the team and, and Reggie, you know, the, the funny thing about Reggie is it actually kind of took him a while to sort of be perceived as a star. Like he didn't get it. He had one all-star berth actually in the 1990 season. Didn't even have another one until 95, which is kind of, I know that position was loaded, but that's, that's sort of crazy um, mm-hmm. to have happened. And they also had Chuck person, uh, Rick Smith, who was in his second season, LaSalle Thompson, who was a, 
a long time uh, big man, and I believe he's in our Twitter background. Isn't that right? I believe so. Yes, yeah, with uh, with Kareem and yes. um, yep. Chuck Person's a guy that I um, w- in doing research for this. I never realized how good he was for the his little run with Indiana. Yeah, um, he's a good player. Yeah, I mean, he was kind of considered. Yeah, I think he and Reggie were kind of neck and neck yeah. stars on that team. So. Um, but over the next four seasons, it, it's funny because they the Pacers finished with 42, 41, 40, and 41 <laughs> wins and lost in the first round every year. That's NBA hell right there. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, well, I, I guess it's probably they could have, like, not made the playoffs. I guess that would have been worse. But then but, you get a better draft pick. Well, yeah. I mean, that's I, why it's NBA hell to just bit, be good enough to. Right, but, stay. I mean, would you rather have, I mean, that's the difference between the four, 15th and the 14th or whatever. You know, I mean, that's not a huge difference, I guess. But, um yeah, so I mean, the big problem with the Pacers during that year is that they their defense was just always pretty bad. I mean, they were like twenty fourth, twenty sixth, nineteenth, and twenty first in defense in those uh, those three years. That they 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 traded or uh, I think the first couple seasons they had uh, Dick Versace as coach, and then Bob Hill took over in ninety one and was there for a couple of seasons before they um, brought uh, Larry Brown in, and things changed uh, quite a bit. But um, Detlef, uh he averaged uh, seventeen points, eight point six rebounds, and four point one assists per game. Shot fifty one percent on field goals and eighty one percent on free throws in Indiana in three hundred fifty four games, which is pretty good. Yeah, no, definitely, uh, definitely turned himself into a good little player. Won a few uh, six men or uh, uh, six men of the year award as well. Yeah, so. won it in '91. He beat Dan Marley by one vote, and then won it uh, the um, next year, yeah, the next year as well. Um, and uh, the funny thing, yeah, they they would also d- the Pacers would dig themselves into holes quite a bit. Like they would just keep like for whatever reason they would start off poorly, and then we'd get better throughout the season, and then would end up with you know nearly 500 record, and then of course would lose in the playoffs, but. Um, but they lost to the um, they lost to the Pistons. They lost to the Celtics, and they uh, lost, lost the Celtics twice, and they lost to the Knicks. So they did take the Celtics yeah. to five in '91. That was, I guess, probably the best of the teams that they had. Um, and then, that, well, that year was, uh, I guess, Game Five was known for best for Larry Bird falling on his head, becoming unconscious, and then eventually returning to lead Boston to victory, which was kind of <laughs> like one of the last Magic, you know, Bird moments. Yeah, yeah. Um, as well, I, I was watching the video on this one as well. Um, and yeah, he definitely has a concussion. <laughs> They're just kind of like, well, whatever, just get it back out there. Yeah, but that's put fine. some dust on it, you know. Yeah, um, the old days, the good old days where yeah. <laughs> player safety was ah, just shake the cobwebs out, kid. Exactly. <laughs> You're good. Just like, okay. But no, he, uh, yeah, it was uh, a fun game too. And that's, uh, I know, um, watching the video of that one too, you see Chuck Person just being a beast in that series as well. Yeah. And uh, Bird had trouble pronouncing uh, Detlef's name. It would be Deltliff, which is just like the uh, – Close enough. That's, that's the Larry Bird, you know, that I – He's uh, the hick from French Lake. Yeah. Close enough. Come on. There we go. Um, in 92, he, you know, has another strong year, again, the, the sixth man year follow-up. Uh, but mm-hmm. then in 92, he wants to be traded he, – he I guess he's four seasons into a 10-year deal after the Pacers refused to rework his contract um, – Donnie Walsh is uh, the Pacers GM at the time, um, and uh, it was just kind of basically like he feels like he's being taken advantage of, and Walsh's like, well, you know, it, um, you know, he, he's still making okay money, and you know, we uh, are over the cap, so too bad. So, um, I, but, though I guess it ended up being worked out because he um, ended up being a free agent after uh, the yeah. '94 season, I believe. So. So, and that was, I think this came up in the Pippin podcast too, but we can maybe look that up. Something, something happened around this time as well. Didn't they get a new TV deal? Because this was the same, I think, I'd have to look it up exactly, but I'd have to go back to the Pippin one. I wonder if, the, I think this is the same time when Pippin started getting really weird about, because he signed a long-term deal after, I think, the 90, uh, was it this one? Was it the 91, 92 season that he started getting weird about his contract? Because I think that they signed a new TV deal and then, it was you know, there was a ton more it. money and other people were getting signed. And then these people that had signed right before that were like, uh, you know, can I get more money? And the other guys were like, no, you know, to the owners, you know, for their side of the argument, like, no, I'm not just going to give you money just because you asked about it. But yeah, to be a free agent, though, that was probably a better idea for him in the long run. Right. So. And they had a couple of short lockouts in 95 and 96, which were kind of related to that. And yeah, of course, yeah. the big one in 99, where kind of everything, you know, we have basically the structure that we have today because of the 99 lockout. So, um, and he, he plays for a now unified Germany in the 92 Olympics. They, they made the eight man tournament, but they lost in the first round. They lost, uh, 
one eleven to sixty eight to U.S. during group during group play. So you know they did okay, but um, but uh, you know <laughs> no one was beating the dream team that year, obviously. So. No, yeah, that was going to be tough. Yeah, that that, <laughs> that score is actually probably not pretty bad. That that that's a victory, right? <laughs> for unified it, Germany. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Well, <laughs> they didn't lose by eighty, we'll, we'll so count that's it as a victory for Germany. <laughs> yeah, that's chalk that one off. Isn't officially it? a victory. So <laughs> yes, um, ninety three season. Um, he actually statistically had his best season. He made the ninety three um, All Star team. I guess he started sixty games because uh, the uh, the Pacers traded a Chuck Person for mm-hmm. um, Sam Mitchell. So. Um, so basically, uh, he no longer was eligible for the six man of the year. Otherwise, he probably would have won it again. But, you know, he uh, he had a, he had, you know, a great season. But, um, you know, they hired Larry Brown as a coach and Indiana's philosophy sort of changed uh, more under defense. So uh, a, a trade is going to happen near the beginning of the uh, next season. That's going to uh, change uh both franchises' fortunes, so I think we'll get into that um, when we talk a bit about the uh, about the Sonics. So I think we're going to take a little break and uh, talk about some other things, and then go back to uh, Detlef's career. For the Sonics, McMillan Perkins from the bench with Peyton Detlef, Shrimp, and Sean Kemp, twenty-six to ten, with four twenty remaining in the first quarter. Perkins going low to Shrimp against Ori. And Detlef Schrempf, who's had a terrific series and led the Sonics with 21 in Game 2 at 10 rebounds as well, brings Seattle to within 14 again. All right, and we're back. We're taking a little bit of a break from Detlef's career to talk about sort of a related topic. And uh, one interesting thing that I sort of figured out with the uh, Mavericks, the 1988 Mavericks, um, they were a one and done conference final teams which basically means they made, they only made the conference finals one time with basically the same team that they had. And I, I sort of wondered how rare that was. So I sort of did some research and looked into, uh, I looked at all the teams since 84, since that's when basically the modern playoff system, um, happened. And actually it's, it's more common than I expected it to be, but it's still, you know, I, I think it's interesting sort of, of, these are all, I think all these teams are like, Oh, they kind of raised the question of like, oh, how much potential did they have? Or like any of these cases, oh, if these teams had won these series, what would we think of them today? You know, so so the first is the uh, Phoenix Suns of 84, who uh, lost uh, in uh, six games. They they, they had kind of a lot of older guys, um, Walter Davis, uh, Maurice Lucas, um, and um, James, well, James Edward was actually fairly young, of course, uh, of later Pistons fame's uh, yeah. Alvin Adams and Paul Westfall. And, yeah, not coaching Paul Westfall. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> playing right. With Paul that Westfall. was his yeah. last season. Larry Nance was kind of their other uh, young star, and they took mm-hmm. the uh, they, they took the Sun or they took the Lakers, excuse me, to six games that year. Now, um, it, because actually the Suns made it to the conference finals again in '89 and '90, and then of course to the finals in '93. But those those '89 Suns had a completely different roster than the '84, yeah. which I, I thought I mean, I'm sure that's not that rare, but that just seemed like wow, five years to have your team completely turn over and to be that successful again that fast I, that that part of it's probably pretty rare so absolutely no certainly yeah that, that was yeah but you can't count them as, as another because it's just they're not the same right, yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, you're, they're, you're, they're in, you're in a five-year gap yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah it's, exactly so i i, I feel like that doesn't count so because you look at these other teams uh, just really briefly like looking at like the 2001 bucks to like the 2006 bucks it's like you know total you know change in roster but they were you know no good for a while exactly. it took them i mean they, they i mean they still have not gotten to that level yet and a lot of these teams we're going to list have really had a lot of issues getting back to that level um you know five years out and then the suns go you know from from one you know completely different core to another and and are successful with it so it's, it's definitely yeah very rare i i would say absolutely so the uh, the nuggets of 85 they lost to the lakers again in five games they Al- alex english calvin Nat, um elson turner uh, dan Issel, kind of toward the end of his career and fat lever uh, the 87 Sonics lost to the uh, Lakers in four games. They had Xavier McDaniel, Tom Chambers, Dale Ellis, Eddie Johnson, Maurice Lucas, and uh, Maurice Lucas again. Um, and uh, they were the team, of course, they were like the 39 win team. It, so it, I guess it's very impressive that they made it all the way to the conference mm-hmm. finals, but then they were swept by the um, Lakers clearly over their head. And the 87 Lakers, of course, being one of the great teams of all time. 
uh, the 88 Mavericks we mentioned. And then we go to the 92 uh, Cavs, uh, who um, took the Bulls to six games. They had Mark Price, Larry Nance again, Brad Doherty, Hot Rod Williams, Craig Elo, and a young Trail Brandon. So that was... So the key to winning the NBA Finals or making the NBA Finals is don't employ Larry Nance or uh, <laughs> or Maurice Lucas. Yeah. Is clearly, as we found out uh, for the first five teams we mentioned, the clear key is don't have either of those two. And then you'll... You'll make an NBA final. I, so. I forgot to mention of the Sonics of '87 had uh, Russ Shaney, you know, the uh, famous yes. uh, the, the, the Shaney uh, projection system. The man who created the projection system, right? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and um, and then the Heat in '97 um, took the Bulls to five games. They had Tim Hardaway, Alonzo Mourning, Vashawn Leonard, Jamal Mashburn, Dan Marley, and PJ Brown. I kind of forgot about Marley being on the Heat. He he, yeah, he, he yeah. bounced around a lot, of course, after the Suns days. And then, as you mentioned, the Bucks of '01, that was just kind of a weird, like, oh yeah, they were that good for a, you know a couple years. Um, Ray Allen, uh, Glenn Robinson, um, uh, Ir- Irvin Johnson, uh, the the big center, um, not of course Magic Johnson, Sam Cassell, Tim Thomas, Lindsey Hunter, you know, a um, a nice team. Uh, I guess that was before they had Gary Payton. Um, yes, yes, that's it right. Was. Yeah, that, that was that was a really good team. There's a funny, um, I, I'd have to see. I have to find it again, uh, but I remember that team, and and I remember you know when they lost uh, one of the biggest things, and 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 all the Bucks team was complaining about it that they thought that the NBA was being uh, they're making calls for Allen Iverson, or they really wanted, to, which I thought was very interesting, you know, in retrospect, that every Allen saying, well, you know, he's their next star, so they want to you know do everything to cater to him, and it's it's funny how that would sort of turn around you know very quickly, and they would do everything to get away from Allen Iverson being you know the representable star of their, of their league. But I, and that one in particular, and I'll have to find the exact quote, but I do remember that being a, a big talking point after is that, you know, the bucks felt slighted by the, the calls there. So, yeah. And, and then it happened twice in Oh two with the Celtics, uh, Antoine Walker, Paul Pierce, uh, Kenny Anderson, uh, Tony Batty and Tony Delk, of course, uh, Kenny Anderson and Tony, Tony Delk being, uh, members of the wonderful 2004, 2005 Hawks team, uh, a couple seasons later. Um, <laughs> And uh, oh, and Antoine Walker. I, I'm sorry, three. Yeah, yeah. you don't even need to. You don't even need to reach for that. Yeah, didn't even lead. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. The, yeah, the most important player on that team. So, um, uh, yeah, that that team. I don't think just was very good. That was just a really weak East. Um, and and uh, and then of course, you know, the, why, why don't you talk about a little bit the the Kings of 2002. Yes, yeah, that's a, a famous, um, you know, the Kings team, obviously, the Chris Webber, Mike Bibby, uh, Divac, Bobby Jackson, Turkoglu, Christy, uh, and Stojakovic. That one was, I always felt that they had a better, I, it was the next year, I think, when Chris Webber blew his knee out, correct? And that, I, I always thought that year, I, I could be wrong, I could be missing a year in there, but I always thought that team was a lot better than the one where, where Webber blew his knee out. But obviously, this one made the, the you know, the conference finals. I mean, famously, you, you probably have heard of this story as well, and the, the famous, you know, rigged games and all that sort of stuff. But very interesting to see the Kings here on this list. And they're a team that, you know, at the top, when you sort of introduce this and talk about teams that would be viewed differently if they had just made, you know, an NBA final. And in this case, I think the Kings, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that the Kings probably would have beat the Nets this year in the NBA finals. Oh, so that's one that would have been a completely different team, you know, in a different, God only knows what would happen to that market too. Cause this is one where you see where, you know, they didn't, they never really quite made it there. And then slowly but surely the team started falling apart. And then the team, you know, obviously they're still in Sacramento, but you know, under, you know, ridiculous circumstances and all that sort of stuff where it was very close that they were going to be moving and all that sort of stuff. So it's so interesting to see a team like this that was, you know, you know, had they have made the finals and if they had won the finals, what would have changed about their history? You know, how would we perceive the Kings these days? You know, just very interesting stuff here. But yeah, that's a, that's a famous team there, the uh, 2002 Kings. And uh, this next team as well was a very interesting one. The, uh, the 04 uh, Timberwolves. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, KG, uh, Spreewell, Wally Zerbiak, Sam Cassell, and Trenton Great Hassel. Team. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think these two, uh, those two teams, I'd probably give the edge to the 02 Kings, but as far those pro- these are probably the two best teams uh, mm-hmm. uh, among these on that list, although, you know, there's some very good ones here. Um, yeah, I, you know, this was, uh, you know, Garnett's probably his best season, just, you know, kind of rushed through and then ran into the uh, the Lakers again, and for, you know, unfortunately in uh, six games. And then, uh, you know, up until the Boston redemption in 08, you know, that was kind of like the – his narrative right yeah, yeah. i mean that this was the best that he had accomplished and then you know they started to struggle after this so you know he um but you know in, in retrospect i mean he had to be, he played amazingly that season and even that postseason um 
then the Jazz of 2007, who actually, they, this was the year that the Warriors upset the Mavericks in the first round. The, mm-hmm. That was the first eight versus one in a seven game series, I believe. Um, right. And then, you know, they have Darren Williams, Boozer, Karolinko, uh, Okor, Matt Harpering, and Derek Fisher. Um, but they end up falling to the, um, in front of the Spurs in five games uh, during that season. And then the 2009 Maver or excuse me, I'm sorry, the 2009 Nuggets. So I think I kind of forgot about like i i hear like a bunch of people who are like oh get out of the first round carmelo anthony i'm like you he made it to the conference finals one <laughs> right, time yeah. i mean I, I get it like you know he's not a long time ago yeah but, i mean <laughs> yeah. memories are go away but sure. yeah I, I absolutely and they had anthony uh chauncey billups Kenyon martin Dene, jr smith chris anderson just lakers to six games and then more recently, the Bulls in 2011, who fell to the Heat, and then the Grizzlies in 2013, who fell to the Spurs. And But those teams are still, I guess, intact enough that if they, they yeah. could make conference finals run this year, they'd still, I wouldn't consider them one and done, you know? Certainly. And the Bulls, Bulls seem like an easy pick there to sort of, especially this year, if everything, you know, goes right health wise to be back there and, and sort of off this list the grizzlies yeah i mean that'd be i mean they still could definitely but that, that'd be interesting they they might be added to this list here in a little bit but as far as you know if we, you never know yeah but as far as you know yeah these two still still pretty much intact as far as you know the bulls you got rose and, and and noah and basic stuff like that and the grizzlies are obviously pretty similar i mean you got randolph and gasol and the, the sort of guys the conleys and that sort of stuff so yeah both still still intact so i don't think we're, we're enough years apart where we can kind of um the Bulls would be an interesting argument if you wanted to make that because they're 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 pretty different, but I think there's enough pieces there that are are, are similar. I mean, so. obviously Derek Rose being the key one, so exactly, yeah, him and him and Noah being the two best players, right. I, You know, has sort of remained. I mean, you you lost Dang and a few kind of bit players and Boozer and those sort of guys, but yeah, yeah, I I, I get what you're saying, but I think they're similar enough. Where like I don't think uh, even though Paul Pierce is on the O2 Celtics, I don't think that those mm-hmm. team is at all similar to the O8 Celtics. You know, right? Plus, exactly. The Bulls yeah. still have the same coach. You know that or well. Did they have to put yeah, no, yeah, yeah. eleven? Yep, yeah, that, okay, yep, that, yep. okay, yeah. So, so that that helps as well, yeah. right? So, um, so yeah, that is the uh, list, and I, I think yeah, just that's sort of an interesting um, like there's a lot of what ifs there, which is always a dangerous game, but a fun one too. So, um, so so good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we'll be back in uh, just a moment, and we are going to talk about the second half of Detlef Shrimp's career. Detlef Shrimp, Detlef Shrimp, Detlef Shrimp, Detlef Shrimp. Okay, and we're back on the Overback podcast talking the career of Detlef Shrimp, and now we're getting to the second half of his career, which uh, Jason started off with the trade of the Sonics. And uh, of course, as we mentioned at the top, the NBA trades, uh, .tumblr.com has a, an amazing post on this, just like... <laughs> I just kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I mean, that man is the most detailed trade breakdowner I've ever. I mean, it's it's awesome. And then and, and yeah, it, definitely check in a very interesting and fascinating way. Not not just listing facts, but but you know, yeah, exactly. But, but really yeah. interesting writing as well. So, but I wanted to make a shout out, especially this one of reading this one. You, you know, in the way this is sort of a trade that, in, in the grand scheme of things, maybe doesn't mean a whole lot for us in this research of this piece that you know or this episode. It meant a lot to us, but. The fact that that much work went into, you know, a Derek McKee for for Detlef Shrimp trade, that's, I mean, that tells you all about that that blog, and all you need to do is check that one out for sure. But no, this is very interesting trade, you know, going from Indiana to the Sonics, and and one that he sort of had mixed feelings about. Yeah, well, you know, he was upset at the timing of it because it was November first, ninety three. So, so I guess right before the season mm-hmm. would have started, um, and he said they could have done this a month ago and showed me some respect. Um, yeah, he talked about going to training camp uh, and working out with the team and doing all this sort of stuff, and he sort of he sort of in, said in a way that they knew I was going to be traded. They just needed to work out, you know, the paperwork or whatever. And he, he said that that showed a lack of professionalism on their end to have him, you know, go around and do the training camp and do all that sort of stuff. And, and knowing full well that the trade was probably going to happen. And, you know, we don't know about that exactly, but you know, I, I, I get a little bit of his, his, but you're a, prof- I mean, that happens. Professional yeah. Sports, so. I, 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 I get, I, I can understand both sides of that. And then some of the teammates are like, Dale Davis and Reggie Miller and Sam Mitchell are all kind of like, oh, no comment. You know, I, there's some un- uneasiness in this in that locker room, you know, coming off. <laughs> Sam of, Mitchell pretty much guarantees he's next. On the right. Yeah. Uh, on the um, after the Chuck Person trade. Um, but this was definitely, you know, a, a, a turnaround trade for for. Well, I I mean, I, the, the Sonics were already pretty good. I mean, they, they had won. Um, they had. 
I think they came out. Yeah, they came off a Western Conference Finals run in '93, and you know, um, so they were already there. But I think that left helped, you know, shore them up a little. Yeah, uh, certainly. I think this is one of the ones, and we, we we talked about this in the show prep uh, for this. Is it's very interesting, and it's one that we don't see a ton these days. But it, it was one that just sort of worked for both teams. It was, you know. Here, you take this guy, you take this guy. I don't think there's a way that you can say any team really came out, you know, better or worse. I think maybe, you know, maybe the Sonics a little bit because that left turned into a really good player. But Derek McKee helped them out as well. And, you know, the Pacers went on to have a, you know, good run in the mid-90s. So this is one that, yeah, it's not one of those we too often now. And I think that might be created by the media, too. We're always looking for winners and losers of every trade. Well, sometimes, you know, everyone's good. You know, it's just, yeah. here, you take this one. Or I call them, like, you know, a challenge trade of, you know, here's my good player. Here's your good player. Let's swap them and see what happens. And both teams did really well. Yeah, so. and the next uh, seven seasons for the Pacers under Larry Brown and Larry Bird, you know, they're a, uh, you know, plus 50 or they win 47. Then they're a plus 50 win team pretty much every year, except for 97. They have a drop off and then the lockout year, but they're still very good those years. So that obviously, you know, helped them. And then the Sonics are, you know, a 50 or 60 plus win team up through the, you know, up until the lockout year. So. Uh, So strong for both. There definitely was some feeling of Seattle as though, like, even though Detlef would, they were glad he was there and he was respected as a player. And, you know, they didn't outright say that, but probably was considered a better player, but that there was definitely a feeling that McKee was missed in the locker room. Mm -hmm. And and we'll kind of get to that um, uh, actually pretty quickly. The uh, 93, 94 season, they win 63 games. They actually started 16 and one and were 26 and three at one point. Um, Kendall Gill is a newcomer as well. Um, And uh, Shrimp is second in minutes to Gary Payton. Uh, Kemp is there. Former teammate Sam Perkins is there. Um, Nate McMillan and then uh, a aging Ricky Pierce is uh, there as well. So he didn't he didn't cross paths with Ricky Pierce. Uh, no, because Ricky Pierce was in Milwaukee. Oh right, so never mind. Never yeah, mind. that's me talking <laughs> the Milwaukee. Yeah, never mind. I got the Milwaukee and uh, Dallas Mavericks mixed up because we were talking about them. Never mind. That's, that's all right. Carry on. Uh, yes, yes. So um, they are, um, you know, excellent. You know, they're second in offensive rating and third in defensive rating. Uh, but you know, there's an SI piece early in the season that that talks sort of a bit how much they like to fight each other. George Cross says they're we're crazy at times. We yell and cuss at each other, maybe a little more than most teams. Shrimp himself says this team doesn't hold anything in, but I have no problem with that. I'm pretty emotional myself. Um, Maybe sometimes people on the scene say things they might regret later, but it's only because they're so committed to winning a title. After years in Indiana, that's something I'm glad to see. So, <laughs> Side yeah, yeah, I, I think maybe I, I you know, I, I, t- I consider that mild, but I get what you mean. Yeah. So, was... um, you know, it, but it's looking pretty good. But there's also sort of like the question of like leadership and the question of like having the go-to guy and that sort of thing and the feeling that they didn't have it. There's yeah. a lot of questions about Peyton at this point. You know, it's, you know, easy to you know, see him as, I mean, he's obviously an all time great and he's a hall of famer, but um, you know, just whether he had what it took, you know, compared to some of the other great point guards in the league, uh, like Stockton for instance, is someone he's comparing himself a lot to quite a bit. So, and they're upset by the nuggets in the first round, the first time in a number eight beat a number one seed. Um, this being a five game series, yeah. And they, in fact, they blew a 2 0 lead. Um, and Detlef actually was really, like, numbers wise, he was very, very good in this series. Like, and he was the only one really of the, um, you know, in the series who consistently kind of played well, um, you know, through the whole thing. But he was, you know, just a guy who, um, you know, he, he was looking good, but the rest of the team, you know, w- was kind of up and down. Um, yeah, Kemp in particular had a real bad eye. He shot 30, uh, 37%, uh, 14 points per game. But yeah, Dallas led them in, uh, I think, field goal, yeah, field goal percentage points. You know, it was, he had a great series, definitely. And then the rest of them, yeah, not so much, as you said. But yeah, um, so um, then and there's sort of a breakdown of that series, basically talking about them being uh, the, the feeling that they were high strung, susceptible to pressure that like their you know, heavy pressure defensive system didn't necessarily work well in a long series because teams could adjust to it. And once it became a ha- half court game, the Sonics weren't nearly as good. And also their lack of a go-to guy. So also there was a fight between Ricky Pierce and Gary Payton in game two. Um, and, uh, and then Detlef has an encounter with um, Brian Williams of the Nuggets, who, who's a, a character I didn't know much about, but um 
he, but he's sort of an interesting, uh, uh, colorful in some respects, although he also dealt with some depression and some other issues um, that, you know, uh, so he was a little bit just, you know, volatile, you know, not obviously not by his own fault, but just, you know, the way what he was dealing with. Um, and basically just, is you know, I'm going to bleep you up, screamed Williams, and then Trump said, I think that was Matumbo. Was that, well... I think that was Matumbo. Yeah, I, I, maybe maybe William said it as well, I, but I know I, there, there's, yeah, there's a... another one with Matumbo. Well, I mean, this might probably be the same incident. Uh, I think it's the same about. incident. Yeah, I'd imagine. <laughs> unless yeah, they had multiple that, encounters. That would be with right. Yeah, I guess it. Brian yeah, Williams, but... it basically, Shrimp like challenges him, like Williams, and says, you know, you and who else? You bet. You know, and he took steps closer. You better get some help. And then Williams goes berserk, and he was uh, objected. So ejected. So it was just kind of a an instance of Detlef, you know, not taking uh, any smack from anybody. Kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, it, it's a they didn't end up adding up too much since they lost that series. But you know, just sort of an interesting, um, yeah. you know, for the most part, a guy who seemed to. I don't know whether whether he was a he, he kind of seemed like a cool guy on the court to a certain extent, but then he did have some he talk, called himself emotional, did have some outbursts here and there. So, you know, I guess we're all complicated people, you know. So, um, and then uh, and then want to talk a little bit about ninety four ninety five? Yeah, so ninety four ninety five. Um, obviously fifty seven wins. They were the fourth seed, so they fell a little bit there, and then they fall again in the first round. This time to the Lakers. Um, I found a, a, a few particular notes here uh, about this team when I was doing a little bit of play indexing. Uh, they were second in offensive rating, and I wanted to kind of look. And they, they were they had a pretty decent defensive rating this year as well. But I wanted to look at teams that had similar offensive rating and similar defensive ratings. Yeah. And I, and this I, year was. Rich, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I actually I think um, we're talking. You're talking about the ninety three ninety four because the ninety five. 94 95 they were second in offensive rating and 10th in defensive rating. oh sorry no they, they did fall in no 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 that, that's correct uh, yeah no that that's because what i said is they were um they were they were good defensive rating or they were good offensive rating but defensive rating slipped a little bit but i, I gotcha. what i did for this play indexing yeah okay. no what i did is i looked at teams that had comparable ones uh both of offensive rating and defensive rating but mainly focused on offensive rating because they were such a good offensive team this year uh and i sorted it by offensive rating to see you know okay so of, of teams that had comparable offensive rating and comparable defensive rating you know, of those teams, you know, how did those ones do? How did the ones with the really good offenses fare? And it was pretty interesting. Uh, five of them made the NBA Finals. Uh, three made the Conference Finals. And then only two of them lost in the first round. And interestingly enough, they are both Detlef Shrimp teams. It's the 86-87 Mavericks. And then this, the 94-95 the Supersonics. Okay. So yeah. very interesting uh, how that sort of worked there. And a little, a little bit of finagling there, but I, I, it, it, it worked out where you basically look at teams with really good offensive ratings and, and pretty decent defensive ratings. Of those teams, pretty much every single one of them will make the NBA Finals gotcha. or okay. the Conference Finals or something like that. Whereas the, the Supersonics, you know, they lost in the first round. And then the only other team that was anywhere... In, in its same, you know, the top 10 there was the 86, 87 Mavericks, and they also lost in the first round. So, Delif is a, a choker. I'm starting the narrative right there now. There you go. So. We, we <laughs> we're going to start gonna, the here. There you go. Even though he plays really well in most of these teams. Yes, but so even though he's, we're going to start the narrative. Even though so, he's a great player, that's how these things and work. And we like so. him a lot. He's a choker. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how these things work is I make it up, and then it just starts for no reason. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, pretty much the same team returns. They're 57 and 25, as you mentioned, the slippage in D, because the year before they were second in offensive rating yes, and yeah, third in yeah. defensive rating. I think I might, might have mentioned, but. Um, and uh, they fall. They're the fourth seed. They fall to the Lakers in the uh, first round. I believe they took a 2 0 lead in this series, too. Oh, let me find that out for sure. Oh, yeah, that I, would be, I'm sorry. Uh... A, a 1 0 lead. They, they won the first okay, game but... and then lost the next three, but. Um, and they won the, the first. They won the first game by like twenty five points, and then they lost the others by <laughs> yeah two points, four points, and four points. So, Jeez. <laughs> um, so yeah, not you know Nick Nick Van Exel, Vlade Divot, and Cedric Sabalos are tough to contend with. You know, um, that's a bad league. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, they were okay. They were, I, you know, they had, the Sonics are the Sonics <laughs> should <laughs> clearly have won. Yeah, they were forty eight and thirty four, yeah. so they were. Uh, oh, and their expected the Lakers expected win loss that year was forty and forty two. They, they way Jeez. outperformed their, uh, yeah, uh, their their expectation. So, um, Detlef made the All Star team for the uh, second time. I, I think probably this this or the next season would statistically probably be his best season. Mm-hmm, certainly yeah, yeah. He, he's he's right around um and, but he's playing at a, uh, a you know really consistently great level and he is you know at this point he's uh 32 um so he's continuing you know he's not dropping off like a lot of guys do kind of you know uh, around this time especially guys you know i, I guess he's taller so you know the, the guys who are taller kind of tend to do a little bit better you know um the small forwards who are taller but um 
and the ones you can shoot as well as he can shoot. But um, this is his uh, his highest uh, win share year as well with twelve point nine. He also led the league in offensive rating as well. So yeah, really good year all around. Yeah, yeah I would say I'd probably put this ninety four ninety five probably his best. But yeah, the next year was pretty good too. But no, he he absolutely it wasn't a token sort of we need to get this. Uh, he he earned an all star berth for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. He's a good all star in this. Yeah, you know. Um, so, um, so you know, they're coming off two years of playoff disappointments, and then, you know, something has to change. Uh, they add Hersey Hawkins. Um, Trump actually gets – is uh, he plays 60 games. I'm assuming he he got hurt. I actually don't – not sure I, if I looked it up specifically, but um, – so he um, – but they're able to kind of uh, – you know, some summon whatever um, will they had because other than Hawkins, who was a big addition, they didn't really make a lot of changes. But they're able to, um, you know, come back and uh, make a run to the um, uh, to the finals. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, there must have been those horrible jerseys. Was, was this the first year of the awful jerseys? This was the first year of the awful jerseys. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's the so, <laughs> the key is maroon. Yeah. It's they good. they beat they. Beat the Kings easily in the first round. They sweep the Rockets with the defending champions in the semifinals, and then take the Jazz to seven. And they're yeah. interesting because there's an SI article about them um, winning and uh, or, or in early in that Utah series when it's about. It seems like they're about to win it. Like uh, they again, I think they actually like. I think they win the first two games of the series. I'll have to double check that but um yeah they won the first two games of the series and then it still goes seven <laughs> so um they lost the next two and then or actually they, they were up three one and they almost blew a three one lead um so uh but they were able to get past the jazz who of course are going to be you know the finals teams in the next couple of seasons um but it, it's funny where it's sort of the SI article writes it as if it's assumed, it, which is funny given the, the Sonics the playoff history. history. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and Shrimp says, we were spoiled children then talking about the previous two years. Now we are grownups. Um, and there's just a funny quote from George Carl about like just – he says, I'd love the challenge of messing with Michael's head. Uh, maybe we'll triple team him. Maybe we'll start Irvin Johnson on him. Maybe we won't guard him at all, <laughs> which is just. I like the not guarding him at all. Yes. Now, obviously, strategy. Carl's not. Just... Obviously, Carl's not being serious, but it's just funny. Like, uh, <laughs> it's not a bad strategy. That, feel, that feels like, you know, like just something that George Carl would say, you know. Well, that's just George Carl being like, look, what do you. I'm sure the question was like, well, how are you going to stop Jordan? He's just I like, don't know. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, what am I. Yeah. What am I yeah. supposed to do? Shut Although, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll get into it. Yeah, we'll get to it. Bit, but he found something. Yeah. But, a little, but too late, um, obviously. Uh, and there's a funny thing, um, follow up from SI, where talking about the um, the end of the series, and then they're talking sort of about like good luck charms or just doing whatever. And then um, that left like he had some lucky underwear, but then he couldn't remember which pair it was. He said, I thought, is it the boxers <laughs> or the briefs? <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, can't be lucky under if you don't know which one it is. Yeah, like, well, if you don't know any description of the lucky thing. It's clearly not. You know, it can't be that lucky. I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's psychological. <laughs> so uh, the um, and then we get to the 1996 finals. Uh, the Bulls uh, take a a three zero lead. Of course, this is the year the Bulls were a 72 win. You know, greatest yeah. regular season record of all time. Probably the greatest team of all time. Um, they actually took a three zero lead, then lost two before winning in Game Six. Um, and then it took until Game Four for Peyton to take the challenge of guarding Jordan. And Jordan, I mean, the first, the big difference between the first three games: thirty one points, forty six percent field goal shooting, fifty three point percent field goal shooting, which is absurd for Jordan, who obviously wasn't a great three point shooter. And uh, and then twelve point three free throw attempts per game. And then the last six, you know, he's down more than seven points, 23.7, down 10% in the field goal percentage, way down in three-point um, field goal to 11%, and then, you know, a couple less three throws a game. So, you know, maybe if they'd have gotten Peyton on him earlier, it might have made a difference. I mean, it might have made it at least tougher, you know. Uh, again, who knows, but that's sort of an interesting subplot yeah. to that series. And that that came fairly close to go, getting to a game seven. I mean, that that series, that, that game um, – that game six was, was fairly tight till the end, if I recall correctly. Oh, yeah. No, it was. Yeah. And I remember that series in particular living in Chicago. People were very – I mean, it was like – you know, they're up 3-0. Everyone's getting the parade route ready and all this sort of stuff. And then it's like, you know, it's 3-2 you know, and people are getting very – I remember especially, my, you know, my parents and my dad in particular was just like, you know, th this is the greatest team ever. You know, they cannot lose this. You know, they can't blow this. 
being you know the greatest team ever, especially when you're up three zero. It was just it, it was ridiculous. And even that last game, as you mentioned, you um, I, I remember not too long ago I went and watched the. Um, uh, the tape of the, 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 I think it's on YouTube, this entire game. And, and the intro was very, I mean, Bob Costas is introducing this as like, the Bulls are choking, you know, can they stop choking? Or, you know, it's something like, you know, the upstart Seattle or is, you know, using their length and their destruction, their explosiveness. It was like very much painted as the old time Chicago. You know, they're getting, they're getting tired. It's very long in the season, this sort of stuff. Whereas the Sonics were, were just getting their second win and ready to go. It's very interesting to see that. And, and, you know, they ended up winning by, I think 12, the, the Bulls won the final game, but still, yeah, it was very, I, I remember it was very tight. People were, were a little worried. Yeah. And uh, uh, Curtis Harris, probeshistory.com, mentions uh, in a great post on Detlef on the series being notable for both teams, you know, having uh, prominent foreign players, uh, Detlef, of course, and then the Bulls having uh, Tony Kukoc. And, um, you know, and, and I'm sure that probably, um, you know, was a key kind of stepping stone for more European and, and more international players just making their totally. way into the league. Um. And then after that, um, you know, we go into uh, we go into '97, and then the, uh, the 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 Sonics are still uh, very good, but they never quite reach. You know, they, they obviously don't make the finals again in um, in '97. They end up falling in the second round to um, a now uh, the Rockets, Rockets right? The Rockets, yeah, yeah, with yeah. with yep. Charles Barkley now yep, on, yep, that on team. the team. So. Um, and that, and another terrible uniform uh, cross <laughs> catastrophe, of course. The battle of the worst uniforms, and, and Houston won. So. Yeah, there you go. I mean, um, Detlef makes the All Star team for the last time at age thirty four. Uh, another game where he only, he only played sixty one uh, games that year. Mo most seasons he played, um, you know, close to uh, you know eighty games. There are only a couple years where he, yeah. you know, he didn't do that. Um, uh, so, you know, obviously being healthy is a is is definitely great for being a good basketball player. Um, and then 97, 98, they sort of make a jump again um, to 61 and 21. They actually trade uh, Sean Kemp. They, they they add Vin Baker and they actually improve. And Dale, Dale Ellis came back. Yes. <laughs> again, yes, we need uh, Dale Ellis. We had, need Dale Ellis. Dale Ellis yes. had 1,900 minutes at age 37, which is uh, That's not bad. Impressive. Yeah. He, yeah. Um, and, and you talked about this uh, for the previous year as well, but it seemed that Seattle's strategy for, for you know, getting better uh, in the previous year and, and, and in a little ways this year was just to get older and get a lot more old. Like like the next year they, or the year that we just talked about the prior year, they brought in like Craig Elo and like like he's like 36 or 37 at this yeah, point. And there's have... just a bunch of – I mean just an old team. They got old in a hurry. But the, the Baker trade helped that uh, – you know, get get a little bit of youth in there as well, but, but yeah, it's yeah, very a lot of guys over thirty on this. Yeah, team. I mean, guys who are over thirty four are Detlef, uh, Sam Perkins, David. Well, David Wingate's thirty three, uh, Craig Elo, Terry Cummings, and Nate Millen's yeah. thirty two. You know, kind of. They also have Eric Snow there, who's twenty three. He, he probably seemed like he always seemed old to me. So. Yeah, well, he's got an old man face. Right. Yeah, Terry Eric Snow is a man who who was born looking like he was like thirty three years old. Yeah, so. and then the uh, the ninety eight. Uh, season um you have yeah, baker comes in and before, yeah. before he has his his issues um with substance abuse jim McElvain also came in in the previous couple of years uh greg anthony was thrown in there as well so uh you know yeah just kind of had some looks uh another like I said another great uh regular season team but they uh they win the first round against minnesota but it goes to five games um, I wonder how what the record was of that Minnesota team. Uh, because they couldn't have been that. They couldn't have been. Let's good. see here. Let me. Uh, let's fire it up. Yeah, that could not have been a very good team. Uh, oh wow, the forty, forty-five, and thirty-seven. Oh, okay, so they were okay. Um, who's who's this team? What is this? Is this a Gugliotta led team or? Well, they they Garnett. Oh, this is Garnett. Okay, no, this is the Garnett. Okay, no, this is the, the, yeah, this is the Garnett Marbury Gugliotta team. Okay, they were that was okay pretty good, Yeah. And Cherokee Parks is probably the key. To that. <laughs> I, yeah, I think he was absolutely. <laughs> and, and whoever Dewan Wheat is, but <laughs> hey, he's got the last name of Wheat, so I'll take that. Who the hell's Dewan Wheat? <laughs> I I don't remember Dewan Wheat. I'm sure there's Let's somebody see, listening yeah. who knows Dewan Wheat. Okay, he played two years. He played for Minnesota. He played for Vancouver, and then he said, "I am done. I, I am. <laughs> I have had enough of this NBA." Yeah. <laughs> or more likely, the NBA had enough of. No, no, the, no. The, how, the NBA how, was tr only five bucks to sponsor one week's uh, was, baseball reference page if you'd like. The NBA to, so. was like 15 years ahead of the time and going wheat free. Yes, <laughs> gluten free. It's also the Stanley Roberts uh, years as well. Yeah, which is is his one year with Minnesota. So that's a he's always an interesting character to look at. Which is in, very yeah, uh, very odd career for one Stanley. But um, I don't know what to say to that. I'm sorry. 
No, he had a he had a he was he's a guy that he's like a potential guy. Everybody sort of thought he was going to be a lot better and just never really ever. He had some weird issues in college and all that sort of stuff. We'll we'll, we'll get to it when we do the Stanley Roberts. Okay, oh, yeah, I so. mean I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that one that one I'll learn <laughs> a lot because I that one I honestly don't know a whole lot about. I I'm I'm afraid to say. So okay, well. uh, 98, the uh, they fought the Lakers four games to one, and um, this is of course now where Shaq and Kobe are um, <laughs> are there. Although Eddie Jones is is still you know Kobe's still playing a uh, he only played 30 minutes in the series, so he's not playing a whole lot yet. Um, Eddie Jones, Nick Van Axel, Robert Ory, Rick Fox, Derek Fisher, you know the, all those guys are kind of playing more. Um, and uh, yeah, probably they just didn't have much of an answer for Shaq, who averaged you know thirty points uh, and nine point six rebounds uh, in four blocks during the series. So that's pretty good. The uh, yeah, Detlef was second uh, on the team in in points, and you know he he did he looks like he did pretty well. He shot well, um, <laughs> didn't shoot great from three, but did everything else pretty well. So. Um, you know, just again, another, uh, you know, I, I don't know this, the, the whole George Carl thing is probably a bigger discussion than we have time for right yeah, now, right. but I do wonder just uh, food for thought. I do wonder if George Carl's problem is more that he, he, his, he underachieves in the postseason, or if he overachieves in the regular season. Yeah, that's I've always I've always been in the mindset because I love Carl. I think he's a great coach. I think he overachieves in the regular season, and then when when you know kind of push comes to shove in the playoffs, where the you know the games get tighter, the rotations get smaller. Because I think he really excels, and you can see that even with the, the most recent Nuggets teams, he excels in making or at least getting a team where they, they, they're so deep that they will just run you out in the regular season because they can go 10 deep or whatever. They can go, you know, because that Nuggets team, when they traded Carmelo and got, you know, this you know package of, you know, five or six guys that were rotation players, you could just instantly, I mean, that's perfect for George Carl, for him to just, you know, I'm sure he was salivating at that thought of, of running a huge rotation. That's always been my thought is I think he's more of a guy that overachieves the regular season and then has these gaudy records and then he gets to the, the, the playoffs and maybe these teams aren't as good as they really are, as he made them. But I can see you making an argument the other way i've always thought of the latter though of him being you know sort of a guy that just overachieved in in the regular season but yeah I, i'll listen to the argument otherwise, yeah I, i'd like someone to at, at some point like make the like looking at all of his postseason seasons and looking at whether you know how, how many times really he came out of a series that he should have won i mean that, that, that mm-hmm. definitely happened and it could be a pace issue as well because his teams do play pretty fast and that's always been sort of the uh, another thing as well is you know playing in the playoffs you kind of have to slow it down a little bit and how do you you know yeah how do you work well when you have to do that and his team's kind of are, are, are based on that you know not the, you know the don nelson style frenetic pace but 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 a high pace for sure, sure. yeah i mean I, yeah i i think there's i i I think a lot of people assume, though, that George Carl just has, uh, you know, is just a bad coach in the playoffs. And I think there's, it's probably more complicated, you know. I guess, yeah, you know, I so. agree. Um, uh, 99 season, the lockout year, they're 25 and 25, do not make the playoffs. Um, Paul Westfall is their coach. Uh, Detlef still performing well, slips very little in the season, plays all 50 games, which I guess, you know, impressive at that age and in dealing with that schedule and um, all that good stuff. So, um definitely impressive stuff um uh he there's a quote for from a denver post article at the end of the season um i guess after it would have been during the playoffs but after seattle was done with their season he was on the verge of becoming a free agent um he just says that offense defense commitment attitude work ethic just clicking off the reasons why he wanted out of seattle i'm not saying everything is bad but there are so many things that are not right not the way they should be maybe they are just little things but all added up they are depressing so he was not uh, happy to go emo emo tell yes <laughs> yes well you know the uh the germans are known for occasionally being a bit sullen <laughs> yes. so um uh so he signs with the blazers uh who just have of course a cavalcade of old stars <laughs> we talked about this in the uh scotty pippen podcast but if you if you didn't hear that just some of the key ones are of course rasheed wallace who is 25 so young but scotty pippen joins the team he's 34 steve smith joins the team at age 30 damon stoudemire is kind of the other young guy there's Sabonis in there who's 35 and uh, and then uh, Greg Anthony and, and Brian mm-hmm. Grant was twenty seven. Uh, Stacey Ogman's pretty old at this point. Yeah, as well. so he's, he's thirty one. Bonzi Wells is there as well. They they actually yeah, they you know went nine guys who played quite a bit. Jermaine O'Neal at twenty one was you know not playing a whole lot, but was still kind of part of that. So yeah, but they definitely. I mean, they did have some youth there too, but they definitely have like a 
just a, a lot of guys who you know <laughs> need playing time essentially a lot of guys yes. yeah and, and we, we found that out too that, that was one of the big um you know criticisms of that year is and, and Dunleavy talked about it as well as uh, head coach Mike Dunleavy is that just people wanted to play and <laughs> you know when you have a team that's you know 10 deep in guys that you know deserve playing time you know those guys are going to want playing time so yeah it was a just just it, it seems like a good idea on paper to bring this like as you said, the cavalcade of old stars and, and good players, and on paper, this always reads like one of like the best teams ever. But it it just doesn't work in principle. It just doesn't. Well, when, when it actually happens, yeah. it, it doesn't. I work. Mean, but you just look at that and you're like, yeah, oh, nice. I mean, they they did well. They did well. Yeah, so. it doesn't work in in one game from making the NBA finals and probably winning the series. Is I mean, that's that is a different definition of doesn't work than say like the 2014 Brooklyn Nets. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, but or the yeah that's probably the best example so um yeah and then they uh Detlef, his minutes drop uh there's a slight decline in his play at 37 he was a little bit upset because he thought he, when he signed he thought he was going to be the starter and then they added scotty pippen who he said you know um i'm not going to lie and say i'm cool with it you know he said i mean probably understood although shrimp honestly probably was better than pippen at this point um yeah, Pippen had, had checked out uh, yeah. mentally and physically. So right. that's that's yeah. He he. I'll give it to Shrimp. He probably would have been a better asset there. Yeah, than... I mean, you know, Pippen was obviously important, but you know, but yeah, exactly. So, um, <laughs> yeah, t- 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 there's a, sort of a story about earlier them in the season where Mike Dunleavy to convey the message that whining won't be tolerated. He brought a pacifier to one of Portland's first practices. <laughs> so I'm sure that went over well. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> so that leads that'll get a locker room together, especially a locker room of veterans that probably can't don't want to take your shit. Right, so like... exactly. And sort of the guys who are young are kind of you know known malcontents as well. So yeah, that's... right. Yeah, that um, yeah. I'm sure that set the stage for a lot of good. Uh, I don't know what happened to the uh, Portland Trailblazers in the years after, but I'm sure it all went well. So. <laughs> exactly. I'll just assume that everything I mean, went well. Assume they won multiple <laughs> championships and everything. Right, yeah. so, um, so his last season is uh, was the old one season. He's um, uh, he only plays 26 games, only 11 minutes per game in the uh, playoffs. Uh, and there's a Pacers.com interview with him. He just talks about being plagued by a lingering neck injury that w- he wanted to retire during the off season, but he was under contract and they asked him to return. So he did so for 26 games Th- that last year when I had to go back and play in Portland, I wasn't really excited about that. Um, it says it just wasn't a good situation. So, and th- this was the year uh, that Kemp came in. Um, Rod Strickland came in. Uh, right. They got older. They found a way they to get older. get older. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you because they traded, they traded Jermaine older. O'Neal for. Yeah. Jermaine yeah, O'Neal got sent up for Dale Davis. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So we needed to, we needed to get this 21 year old out of here and get this 31 year old guy. Yeah. In Trader, here. Trader Bob was their. Yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. You kind of see what they're doing. But yeah. It, well, the it, Dale Davis one that that's kind of Jermaine yeah. O'Neal one. That, that's sort of obvious. Seems obvious, I guess, in retrospect, but whatever. So um, he's done with his career and. Um, you know, obviously had a uh, a very successful career. There's um, a good post on him in the um, from the painted area for which is just was an awesome NBA blog that really isn't updated anymore. But but I really enjoyed it. Um, and talking about you know kind of like what to do with European Hall of Fame candidates and Detlef in particular, just kind of the idea like he was a groundbreaker, the one of the first to have any type of success in the NBA. And kind of the idea that, okay, maybe he'd be a Hall of Famer if he'd stayed in Europe because the guys who stayed in Europe, you know, are definitely in. And someone like Kukoc, who played a lot of his career in Europe and then, you know, had had some strong NBA years is in. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Detlef is maybe being punished because he didn't play enough in Europe, but like because he's in – because of a trend center, you could – you know, it's just a weird – Sir, yeah, yeah. I think it's an interesting thing to to think about. I mean, I, I would, yeah, because it, it it's weird that maybe that, that we're sort of punishing him. It, it, to, sort of to your point that you're punishing him a little bit. Had he had stayed in Europe for a few years and maybe dominated and scored, you know, 25 points per game in Europe, he would be considered, you know, a great European player. Versus coming to the NBA, sort of cutting his teeth there, you know, not not struggling, but not being, you know, an everyday player, a you know, high volume scorer, a high volume player, and sort of working his way up. So it sort of punished him in that way. Which I don't know if that's necessarily fair because I mean he came in and and didn't have any learning pains and really didn't have any strong I mean, he came in and, and was pretty good from the beginning yeah so. i mean he was and, and that kind of leads me to like sort of another thought of like you know is it more valuable to be kind of like a guy who's like has like 
15 very good years and is, you know, pretty steady. I mean, he has some peaks and valleys, obviously, but for the most part is like very good for his entire career. Or do you, is a guy being great for seven and, or, or eight years and then not really being very good or not lasting, you know, particularly long after that, like which is more valuable, which means more, which, you know, mm-hmm. which weighs more. And I, I think it obviously depends on an individual, but I think, you know, Detlef is just a guy who just had that, like, you know, that, that consistency for most of his career and, and that very good, you know, um, career. And I, I think it's interesting to kind of consider the value of that versus like, I, I, Bernard King's the first guy who comes to mind. If like Bernard King had some like three or four really great all-star seasons and then yeah, you know, yeah. was, was kind of good, you know, here and there, and then had some injuries and, and some stuff. You just, in Bernard King's obviously in hall of fame and that left isn't, I don't know if he's really all that likely to get in um, to the pro basketball one anyway, but um, it just, you know, I, I don't know. It's an interesting, it is thought. interesting. Yeah. And, and he's, he's, he's an interesting fellow. Cause I mean, you look at, at, at that left rather, um, you look really, I mean, honestly, of a, a, what I would call a truly bad year. I mean, there's his first and his last are, are the really ones. And I wouldn't even call his first year really a bad one. The last year, yeah, I mean, he, he barely played at that point. But, yeah, he's a very interesting one where, yeah, he doesn't get the same sort of glitz and glamour because he was just, oh, you know, he was just very, he was just good for that long period of time. And it's it's a very interesting question. Yeah, Bernard, Bernard King is a very, um, I mean, he's one that you sort of look at of, yeah, being spectacular for a, three, uh, a few years clearly is better than just being a solid rock for you know as many years as you do but yeah that looks an interesting one and, and and we'll get to it in a little bit but i did some advanced stats looking at him and, and a lot of it could just be him piling up numbers and piling up figures but he's a guy that statistically rates pretty well all time so we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit though. yeah sure uh, yeah we just want to talk about some of the interesting stuff he did his post career um he uh, he started a foundation um, which, you know, sound- he, he, he unfortunately reserved deadlift.com, which I tried to do many times in my early years, but <laughs> it's a great, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, it's so easy. Somebody should have just done that. I don't know what, yeah, the deadlift shrimp foundation, which, you know, sounds like it does some really wonderful things in, yeah. um, uh, in Washington, probably other places. Um, he also, there was a song written called deadlift shrimp by the, by band of horses, which is you know, a nice, uh, it's melancholy, but it's a nice, uh, you know, it's a nice tune. I dig it. We're going to go out with that. I think we're going to go out with that song. Fair enough. Fair enough. We got it right. Yeah, I think fine. it's important. And then, um, and he, and he made multiple appearances on the TV show uh, Parks and Rec, which uh, yes. uh, it does awesome enough. He, he's a really good. He's it, really funny in those. Yeah, like, well, yeah, we, he's so dry and like weird, but it's just it's so perfect for Dallas Shrimp. It's, yeah, they make me laugh so much. Well, it's probably just because I know who he is. And like, I think like my girlfriend when she watches, she's like, "That wasn't that funny." I'm like, "No, but it's Dallas Shrimp," and you know. Then that conversation I, I, goes nowhere, I, I, but you I know. Think, yeah, I, I think he's good. Um, th- there was a. I listened to a podcast recently with a writer from Parks and Rec. Uh, it was a Declo uh, podcast where he talked. Oh yeah, a writer yeah, from yeah. Parks and Rec and talk about what you know, good acting and good comedic timing that uh, Detlef had. So I think it's strong. We, we should certainly more than Roy Hibbert. Uh, Hibbert has his appearances in that show too, and they're uh, they're they're funny just because it's Roy Hibbert. But it's you can tell the difference between Detlef, who kind of gets it, and Roy Hibbert, who just like yeah is Roy Hibbert just kind of like, Hey, what do you want me to do? And like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's very, it, it, very different, but Roy does a good job too. I laughed during his parts as well. Yeah. So, so um, but that, he seems, that left seems like he's an active guy and does a whole lot of, of cool stuff and has managed to kind of keep his name out there. And is a, as far as I know, has never really uh, had, you know, any, uh, any, tr- any trouble, you know, it hasn't had like the, uh, the post playing career that some guys do where they can't, you know, stay out of the news or out of, you know, um, issue stuff. He just seems to like have a, uh, a good life and, uh, good for him if that's true. Absolutely. Uh, we got some questions as well. Do you want me to run down a few of them? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, this, this one is great. And I think, uh, I think we do need to definitely discuss this and maybe we can get uh, Curtis. I don't know if he put this together, but I'm sure someone did. Uh, Rich Thomas at earth dog asks, uh, is Detlef Shrimp in the NBA haircut hall of fame? It's, so I will have to ask Curtis if he if he curated that as well. Yeah, but, uh, well, it definitely would have to be like in the non Afro division. Um, sure, because there's yeah, so that, many, that's a whole yeah. wing. That's the Afros are a wing. Yeah, that that's not fair right. to, it, to rank anybody with. No, Artis Gilmore cannot be ranked with any other human it, being. Like right. he needs to be in his own like world. So it, it, exactly. I mean, yeah, I you know he's uh, it's spectacular. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, he made the flat top work, even though it's you know it's not like my. It, it's it, you know not my favorite haircut but yeah he definitely uh you know he, he made it work for him so i think it belongs there absolutely uh we have joe hall reppin uh it's at joe hall reppin as well uh, on twitter he said uh talk about his domination with sean kemp on those sonics teams in nba jam and that is still my go-to team by the way 
Yeah, they were good. Um, it, it's been it's been too long since I played NBA Jam. I really need to uh, figure out a way to uh, play it again because uh, I enjoyed it so much when I was uh, you know fourteen or whatever, and uh, and it is um, so. Yeah, I mean, I it was always good to have one guy who could dunk and one guy who could shoot threes. Um, yep, that's and, and, they're the perfect perfect combo, and they play good defense as well with that one as well. And, and if worse comes to worse, and you really need some steals or whatever, you can throw Peyton in there as well. So they're they're just the the best team for that. I mean, they're and they're one that a lot of people a lot of people go to the Hornets or like in Chicago, everybody goes with the Bulls, and it's like they don't have Jordan to yeah, eat it, but so. they gave all of Jordan's stats to BJ Armstrong because BJ Armstrong's way too good in that game, right. so it's okay. But <laughs> but no, this is always my go-to team because you have the dunk and the three. So you have you know Sean Kemp goes up for a dunk, and then if everybody jumps, you pass it out to Dettler Trump who just hits a three and then you know I win again so because that's how that works um but 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 um I think that's it. Is that all for our question? Uh, oh, we had one more here. Uh, Rich, Rich Thomas asked another one here that I thought was pretty interesting as well. Um, he said he went to high school in the U.S. Um, it was only for his senior year, but he said, anyway, uh, do you see Detlef Shrimp as a product of European basketball development or American development? So, Jason, uh, what, what do you think on that one? Uh, I would say American um, just because, I mean, his European play was really, um, you know, because he, he took it up when he was about 13. Yeah. So that was really only like four years, and I'm sure those were important, you know, influential years, and they they mattered. But I just think he did so much more in um, in the United States. Um, and as we mentioned too, the, the guy who discovered him in Germany was you know a former NBA player. So right. you know, in a lot of ways, yeah, he was, probably was. It wasn't like they found his, this guy that had been you know like Dirk. You know, I'm not even going to pronounce his his shooting coach guy, but like you know that sure. guy was working with him. It's Hertzgerter, yeah. like <laughs> Zertgerter or whatever. Yeah. Like that guy worked with him since he was like six. I mean, that that's a guy who's clearly developed by Germany. Schrempf was a guy who was just doing whatever, and that, that you know that the NBA guy, you know, sees him and, and, and develops him. And then he comes here and has, you know, four years in Washington and, and, uh, you know, four years in college in Washington rather is what I meant. But yeah, no, he, to me, I, he seems like a guy of American development. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, yeah, I, he did. And he played of course in some of the European tournaments and he, yeah, he yeah. was involved in Europe as well. So, I mean, I think he, he's part, I mean, I guess he's a, a product of bo- both, but if I had to choose like, which one is he more of, I would say American. Yeah. I agree. All right. Uh, I want to move on to another section here. You want me to talk advanced stats? Absolutely. Yeah, here, let's talk about a few things that I did, a little bit of play indexing here to look at. Um, this actually ties in a little bit to a question. We had somebody who asked, uh, who are some notable players in NBA history uh, with similar stat lines? And this is from Andy Altenoff. Um, and a few guys that I looked at, it's actually using total points, total rebounds, and total assists. Uh, three guys that came up real close to exactly the same numbers that he had uh, were, interestingly enough, and I, you know, looking at these guys, I, pretty close. Uh, Richard Hamilton, uh, Richard Lewis, and Bob Dandridge were the three that were as uh, statistically as similar to him. What are your thoughts on those three? Do you, anyone that kind of stands out as, nah, you know, he's nowhere near him. They, they kind of, they kind of works. Yeah, actually. that's about right. I mean, Richard Lewis is kind of an interesting, um, he's, he, to me, he's definitely. And I think if Detlef had played, uh, you know, if his career, you, you know, had begun around the time that he had been on the same, uh, timeline as Lewis when he started and ended his career, or I guess he's still playing, but, um, I think probably um, that left would have been used in a similar way. Sure. Yeah. He was, he was a little bit before the stretch fours in that sense. Yeah. And Detlef to his credit was a way, you know, really good at backing guys down and really good in the post. So, sure. so I get that they wouldn't have just wanted to, you know, stick him out there, you know, for three, but he was a guy who could back out there and, and, and was super efficient from there too. So very, very interesting, but yeah, I thought that was uh pretty cool. Those three guys and, yeah. and how they were pretty similar there. A few other things I found out, um, so I looked at uh, per 100 possessions, points, and rebounds. So um, Detlef is actually one of 26 guys to average um, over 23 points per 100 possessions and over 10 rebounds uh, per 100 possessions. And uh, there's only a few guys that are active and not Hall of Famers, or only uh, non-active guys that are Hall of Famers. There's a bunch that are still active and, you know, are guys that are, are shoo-ins for the Hall of Fame, guys like LeBron and, and, and a few others. But uh, only uh, non-active guys that are not in the Hall of Fame, there's Shaq, who obviously is just, you know, waiting his time and, and will definitely be in there. Uh, Larry Nance... Uh, Rasheed Wallace and then Shrimp. So it's only Nance Shrimp and Rasheed Wallace are really guys that are sort of on the, the fence. And and Rasheed Wallace seems like a guy to me that will probably get in. Yeah, Nance, I that that's probably not going to happen. But Shrimp again comes up and and he's another guy we talked about. You know, does he deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? And and you know, with, when you look at these numbers and the guys he's with, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you could honestly make a a case for that for sure. Yeah, I mean, Nance is a guy who's talked about as like, uh, oh, like you know, he's better than people like recall him mm-hmm. being, and you know, and, and that probably boosts his case. You know, but probably Shrimp has that a little bit as well. Um, so I, that one's that one's kind of interesting. 
Yeah, and then I looked at a few other stats here. I looked at uh, this one's a little bit interesting of how I got here, but you kind of work with me, and I, I can send a link if people have any uh, you know curiosity about what I did. But what I did is I looked at Shrimp's total points, total rebounds, and total assists, and I basically looked at everybody that was better than him, everybody who had more. You know, in these categories. So you basically, to be listed on this, you know, what I'm going to, this data set here, you have to have more total points, more total rebounds, and more total assists. And I didn't add those all together. They're sort of separate, but it kind of works in that way too. So, so basically, yeah, if you need the link, I can send it to you to sort of kind of see what I did here. But I thought it was a really interesting list that we got here. Um, 11 players all time have more of, of all three of those. Uh, Kareem Wilt, Carl uh, Malone, Oscar Robertson, Kevin Garnett, Charles Barkley, Larry Bird, Jason Kidd. As you notice, we're all pretty good players, John Havlicek, Scotty Pippen, and then Detlef. So that's uh, that's very good company to be in. Absolutely. In terms of versatile guys there. Yeah. That, that's, that's the who's who. And, you know, you're going to get, you know, a few guys like LeBron who's going to obviously get in there once he accumulates a few more. But, I mean, that's – that's it's, to its credit, I mean, that, that could be something where you kind of look at a guy who played for a while and, oh, he just accumulated all those stats. But, you know, hey, you have to play a while to get those, and you have to get playing time in all those years to get that. So yeah. I don't think that's something to just – you know, think that that's completely worthless or completely irrelevant. I, I absolutely. And I think, I mean, I think sometimes I think we underrate playing a while a little bit. I mean, I understand right. like not obviously like playing a while and you're not effective. That doesn't help. But, you know, if you're still pretty good at like 37 and 38. And- well, people are going to, I mean, if, if the coach is going to play you and the team's going to pay you to be 37 and play, you know, that's to your credit. Yeah, like, let's not, most get, let's not, you know, pretty good. knock points off for being a guy who can still play when he's 37. Yeah, like, and play, there's no problem play heavy that. minutes. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and then you were looking, I know you were looking a little at, at some of the, uh, top, uh, game scores that he had. Yes. In career. Yeah. So we have game scores and career highs here. Uh, we have five game scores here. Um, his number one game score was 33.3 and this was uh February 28th, uh, 1992 versus Orlando. He had uh 34 points and shot 66% from the field. So pretty good game there. Uh, his number two one was November 8th, 1995 versus Denver. And that was 32.1 game score. Uh, that's a really good game as well. 35 points, uh, eight rebounds, 68% uh, from the field. Uh, you're going to notice the theme here. Detlef likes February. because uh, His third game is February 16th, uh, 1997 versus the Lakers. That's a 31.9 game score. Uh, number four is February 13th, 1993 versus Milwaukee, and that's a 30.9 game score. And then December 8th, not February, Detlef, that's okay, but uh, December 8th, 1992 uh, versus Golden State, that's a 30.7. And um, another interesting as well, I looked at uh, career high games, and it was very interesting that they all came in the same year. Yeah. Uh, his career high of points uh, was 36 on December 8th, uh, 1992, and that was the, the aforementioned game. Or no, I actually didn't mention that game uh, prior. That was, no, that was not one. Yeah, it was number five. Oh, that was number five. Yeah, okay, there it is. Yes, yes. So that was his number five uh, game score all time was the 36 points. Uh, rebounds, he had 23, uh, February 11th, 1992 versus Orlando. And then assists, uh, 14, December 10th, again, 1992 versus Sacramento. So very interesting that 1992 was his, all of his career highs. And then I wouldn't, I wouldn't count 90, you know, 92 as his best year, though. No. We talked about 94, 95 as kind of sticking out. But 92 is a great year, too. So. Yeah, he was, yeah, you know, because there was actually two separate seasons because two of them happened in the 92 yes, season yes, yes, and, right, and one right. happened in the 93 – or two happened in the 93 season. Are they? Oh, no, they're all 90 uh, – December, February, December. No, no, no it's – but they're same year. So it's – the February one happened first and then the – and then there was – Oh, I see what yeah. you're saying. I see, I see. Um, so, yeah, I mean he finished, um, you know, his um, – True shooting percentage, uh, 58.58, is um, tied with Shaq at 38th overall in uh, NBA history, which is, is is kind of interesting. And then his win shares for 48 is 71st overall in um, NBA history. And he finished, you know, with just some great um, 49% f- uh, field goal percentage, 384 from three, 80% f- uh, from free throw line. So, I mean, he really – he was efficient, but, he you know, he, he yeah. put up good totals too. Yeah, and you, you mentioned a few things here, you know, tied with Shaq, uh, 38th overall in true shooting percentage, which is, you know, not bad for him. And then 71st overall in uh, win shares per 48. So that's a, that's a good, I mean, we're looking at a good career here. I think maybe, do we have to start the Detlef Shrimp for Hall of Fame? Uh, well, he's either a choker or he's a Hall of Famer, depending on what part of <laughs> the podcast the, you listen to. I'm reverting, I'm, I'm reserving both of those name, uh, domain names right now. Uh, well, Detlef is a choker.com is, I'm guessing still, hopefully still, okay. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, that hopefully that's not, it's not dirty or something. Yeah, <laughs> that's not no, I got lucky there. And then uh, Detlef for Hall of Fame. Let's do number four, right? There you go. That, that's four. cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it is both available. So anybody who wants to uh, either help us do it or, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll reserve both those and start the campaign. But no, definitely a really good uh, a really good career. And that's a guy who, you know, I probably underrated before we did this as well, before we did the, kind of the research and looked at him all the time. I mean, he's a guy that I sort of, as you mentioned, just thought of as, a, you know, really good for a long time. But 
He's better than that. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, um, you know, and just such a likable guy too. You know, that helps, I guess. Um, yeah, because like kind of the, a lot of the other guys we've done these full length research shows on have kind of been, you know, temperamental to a certain extent. And I guess Shrimp had a little bit of that, but for the, but for the most part, you know, seemed like a guy who, you know, very amiable. So. Yeah, he he was in reading his quotes and reading sort of the stories. He was a guy that was just going to be honest, pretty much. He he wasn't a guy that sort of sugarcoated or, or anything like that. I mean, to an extent, th- th- we could kind of say the same for Rick Barry. But yeah, he's a guy who just kind of said, "Yeah, that's you know, it is what it is." So absolutely. All right. Well, um, so everyone, uh, please uh, check us out at the uh, podiumgame dot com. You can find all our podcasts there. We are also on uh, iTunes on the Hardwood Paroxysm uh, Basketball Podcast Network, along with some other uh, terrific shows, including the Podium Game, and um, and we're also on Twitter at Over and Back NBA. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Uh, which is facebook.com slash over and back. We have a Tumblr, Tumblr over and back. Uh, I think it's over and back nba.tumblr.com. Is that right? Um, I think so. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> over and back <laughs> nba.tumblr.com. Not for good branding there. I don't want all the other ones. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember what our Tumblr is. So, you'll, so. See, you'll see links there. and, and uh, Don't go to over and back because that's a uh, – I'm, I'm looking at it right now, and uh, it's a very odd Tumblr. I don't oh. – I'm trying to make a no-so tutu for Cha's Halloween costume. She's 13, mind you, and is going as a draft. So ah, well, there you go. That is not us. That is not us. <laughs> Over not and us back indeed. NBA is the is important thing. So, um, so if you have anything you want to talk to us about, whether it's about this show or about any other show we've done, uh, you can yeah you know, hit us up on Twitter, uh, post a comment on the uh, post the podium game. We would love, love, love more um, reviews and ratings on uh, iTunes. If you want to, you, you got to look for well, you can, if you look for Over and Back NBA, you'll you'll probably find the uh, Hardwood Proxism Network. But we're under the Hardwood. Pro- Proxism Network with uh, the other Podium Game and uh, podcast. So, um, so yeah. Is there anything I'm forgetting, Rich? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Um, Did I plug everything well? Yeah, you got the Twitter, you got the Facebook, you got iTunes. We like reviews. Did you mention that? Reviews. I did mention that. Yeah, yes. We, okay. We would, we'll do that. We would like the reviews and ratings. Um, uh, yeah, it, we would we would like good ones. But if you have to leave a bad one, like like one guy did, you know, then I mean, you know, that's. It's your choice, you know. You're you're living your life. I understand. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Rich, um, thanks again. I had a, a fun time chatting about uh, debt life with you, and I'm looking forward to the next time we do this. Absolutely, looking forward to it. All right, goodbye, everyone. Mm-hmm.